easy station access, a super simple boarding process, comfortable, fast trains that are better for the environment than the alternatives, all about what makes Spain's high-speed rail great and how it stacks up against rail in the US. So consider that a trigger warning and it's coming up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Viewer suggested topics, always welcome. I do get lots of requests to talk more about high-speed rail and honestly, I'm in Spain, so you knew this video was coming. But this comment I got on Patreon on my weekly sneak peek thread really goes to the heart of my thinking about what makes high-speed rail so powerful. It's how unreliable and stress-inducing the alternatives are as much as anything else. So what I'm going to do today is a little less quantitative than what I usually do with high-speed rail. In other words, fewer mind-numbing graphs, more pretty pictures of trains. I generally make a big deal out of travel time and how the overall trip when you take a high-speed train is shorter than flying or driving at certain distances, but nobody really maths this stuff out when they travel. Well, maybe me. Instead, what they really want is just less hassle. Later I'll come back and talk about Spain's national rail operator, Renfe, and the nation's evolving approach to high-speed rail more broadly. But for now I'm going to focus in on one particular relatively important city pair on Spain's high-speed rail network, and that is Madrid to Valencia, which I experienced recently both directions. I'm going to walk through all the phases of the trip, talk about why it puts competing travel options to shame, and then compare it to the train service for city pairs in the US that are similar in size and distance apart. You might want to look away for that part. Let me just start by pointing out that you can drive from Madrid to Valencia, but driving in Spain is, I think, one of Dante's nine circles. I actually rented a car last time I was here. Never again. If you put a generic departure time into Google Maps, say noon on a Wednesday, you get a pretty wide range of travel times, which pretty much tells you all you need to know about how predictable traffic is. And good luck trying to find a parking spot when you get wherever it is you're going. So for the rest of this, I'm just going to talk about how the train experience compares to flying. First, trip preparation. I mean, packing. This is a part of air travel I just don't enjoy at all. You have to think about whether you want to check a bag or jam everything into carry-ons, what you can and can't bring on the plane, how it's all going to fit. With a train, it's way less stress. You just bring what you want, however many bags, whatever size they happen to be. It's all going to fit because space is not a premium and you don't get charged extra fees and you don't have to jam stuff under the seat in front of you. Okay, let's talk about station access and I'm going to assume you're doing this car free because you're a cool person. If you're flying, you can take the Madrid Metro or the Cercanias, Madrid's regional rail system, to the airport, but it's going to be a longer trip, probably with more transfers. For rail, you're going to go to Chamartin Station, which is closer to the city center, so you're almost certainly going to save time on station access. Worth noting that if you take the Cercanias, your Alta Velocidad España or AVE high-speed rail ticket includes a QR code that gets you through the turnstile for free. And that's not just Madrid. All the major cities in Spain do have Cercanias lines this works for. Let's talk about security lines and waiting time. How much buffer time you leave for dealing with security when you go to the airport is kind of a matter of personal taste, but less than an hour doesn't seem advisable. High-speed rail out of Chamartin has security too. All the Ave stations do. But I went through security several times on this trip and there's never a line. You might want to get to the station 20 or 30 minutes early to queue up for boarding and get your ticket scanned, but you're not really that worried about things like getting in an early boarding group to make sure there's still overhead space when you get on. Those problems don't exist on the train, and really, they're going to let you board up to about 5 minutes before departure. Try that with an airplane. 
So you almost certainly save an hour plus on station access, waiting, and boarding. The actual in-vehicle travel time is shorter on the airplane, but not enough to compensate. And the way people respond to that differential is by demanding more train service. The Madrid to Valencia route is currently down to six flights a day or so, while the high-speed trains are up to about 24 a day, and each train carries significantly more passengers than the planes do. I don't really want to focus on travel time differences, though, because I've done that in several other videos. Instead, let's just talk about how the overall experience is different. On my transatlantic flight to Madrid, my knees were jammed up against the seat in front of me for like 10 hours, which is not a comfortable position for doing anything. This does not happen on a train. The route from Madrid to Valencia is between an hour 45 and two hours, depending which train you take. And probably the only thing that would prevent you from just sitting and reading or working on your laptop or whatever you want to do for the duration is the distraction of interesting scenery flying by the window. Well, that or the snack car, which ends up being an important social hub in a nation where people just love to eat and drink and be chatty. The bottom line is traveling by bullet train is comfortable and it's fun. My experience was the journey was almost always over too soon, if anything. Arriving at Valencia Joaquin Soroya Station, you can get any number of regional trains out of Valencia Nord, which is right next door, or you can hop on the metro, so connections are slick. And like in Madrid, you can get a train from the airport, but that's almost certainly going to be a longer trip, so Ave wins again. Before I leave the Madrid-Valencia route, let's talk about going the opposite direction, because I did that too. And for the trip back, I took WeGo, which is a private operator out of France. It's a budget carrier. This is a double-decker train with more seats, with a bit less legroom, but nowhere near airplane level bad. A bit more of a headache-inducing color scheme in the interior. Fewer amenities. The Ave actually had an attendant who rolled a snack cart down the aisle. And it doesn't come with a Circaneus QR code, so factor that into your trip budget, I guess. Speaking of which, I acknowledge I haven't really talked about price in any of my high-speed rail videos, partly because it's so variable. It depends what time of day you want to leave and how far in advance you want to book. If I look out a couple weeks, though, train tickets are pretty inexpensive. Some of this is the private providers like Wego and Erio out of Italy coming in to compete and also Renfi adding their own lower cost service, Avlo. But mostly I think it's when you increase the supply of something, prices go down and through whatever means, Spain has been adding a lot of seats on this route. Okay, let's compare this to the service we get on similar routes in the US. This is gonna hurt a bit, but I do think there's some level of therapeutic value in coming to terms with this situation and experiencing a mix of bewilderment and outrage as a group exercise. First of all, reminder that I view the viability of high-speed rail routes through the lens of city pairs, with overall travel demand being a function of metro area populations and distance apart, and the competitiveness of high-speed rail versus other options being a function of distance. At about 360 kilometers, or 225 miles, Madrid to Valencia is a strong pair with a distance that's right in the sweet spot for high-speed rail. So I wanted to look at comparable city pairs in the US, basically where one metro area is in that 6 to 7 million range, one is 2 to 3 million, and they're 2 to 300 miles apart. I've got four comps for you, and I'm going to tell you about the available train service for each. Remember, Madrid to Valencia, 24 trains a day, runtime of an hour 45 to two hours, like 10 bucks if you book at the right time. Okay, Miami to Orlando, currently two trains a day. The Silver Meteor makes the run in five hours, 12 minutes, and the Silver Star is like seven and a half hours. This is already as good as it's gonna get among the comparable US city pairs. Brightline will cut this to something like 315 later this year, so stay tuned. Atlanta to Charlotte, the Crescent runs once a day and clocks in at 537. 
Houston to San Antonio. The Sunset Limited does make the run in five hours, 10 minutes, but it only runs three times a week. And DC to Pittsburgh runs daily, but the run time is seven hours, 43 minutes. Let me reiterate, these are corridors that are about the same length as Madrid to Valencia with similar sized cities at each end. They're routes where trains should dominate, but the services just aren't competitive at all. I hope I've left no doubt that the existence of high-speed rail creates a massive benefit for the traveling public. And isn't that what government should be doing? Using its scale and its authority to build regional and national investments that produce wide public benefits? Or is that just crazy thinking? I'm gonna get into some of this, but first, brief reminder to drop a like on the video, subscribe, and hit the bell if you think trains are cool. Consider supporting the channel directly on Patreon if you value having a place where you can come for 15 minutes or so every week where you can feel like it's maybe slightly normal to think our cities should be better than what they actually are. Okay, I have something I have to confess. I lied about my trip from Madrid to Valencia, I actually got off halfway and stayed a night in Cuenca, which, well, can you blame me? And this raises an important point about Spain's high-speed rail network. It connects to a lot of cities, including a lot of small ones, even if it doesn't stop at them. My Wego on the return trip bypassed Cuenca entirely, which shaves a few minutes off the runtime. But Spain gets a lot of criticism for bothering to build rail and Ave stations in some of these cities at all. And a lot of people scratch their heads at why this country has the second largest high-speed rail network in the world. A distant second behind China, but more extensive than France or Japan. What Spain has done pretty much fails any kind of conventional benefit cost analysis. But regardless, it has broad political support and, I don't know, every train I took was full. It facilitates travel all over a country where different regions and communities haven't always seen eye to eye, and it brings those people closer together. And it supports tourism, which is relatively important for Spain. It's something like 16% of the nation's GDP. Anyway, high-speed rail is one of these things where the costs are pretty easy to quantify and the benefits are much less so. So in an effort to stitch the disparate parts of the country together, Spain has built something of a network with all the complexity that entails. You get things like the Andalusian line where the trains to Malaga and Granada are coupled together when you board in Madrid, saving energy on the way down to where they decouple and branch. So make sure you get in the right carriage or you are definitely going to end up in the wrong city. I took the Ave to Cordoba and Malaga, but Irio has a contract to start running trains later this month, and they were not shy about advertising this fact all over Malaga. I guess my question is, if the network is overbuilt, as the critics say, then are private providers making a mistake in gambling that they can turn a profit on service connecting to smaller Spanish cities? It just seems presumptuous to second guess. Okay, let's wrap this up by bringing it back to high-speed rail prospects in the U.S. You'll hear the argument that the U.S. is too big and spread out to do what Spain has done. Or you'll hear the argument that the parts of the U.S. that are actually dense enough for this to make sense are too developed, so it would be too expensive to build high-speed rail there. It's almost as if the arguments are just disingenuous and obstructionist. Here's the thing. The population of Spain is about 47 million, and total route length of the Spanish network is about 2,300 miles. Meanwhile, about 50 million people live in the Northeast Megalopolis, with basically all the cities existing in a straight line that's about 600 miles long. But the Northeast Corridor really doesn't have service that's comparable to what you get in Spain in terms of travel time, or frequency, or price. Call your legislators. And that's all I've got. Thanks for joining today, and thanks to the patrons for continuing to support this channel's rotating cast of A-roll backdrops. This is my last day in Malaga, which has been fantastic. Extremely pedestrian friendly, although eh, a little touristy. But man, you cannot beat the weather.
Keep the great topic suggestions coming. I'll be back next week with a new video from a yet-to-be-disclosed location, but I'll see you then.